Hey, we are, um, I really didn't know where to go this week because uh, we had a pastor here last week and uh, he was tacked with he- Hebrews 3 and he got us through six verses. So I was like, well, do I jump in at verse 7? Do I jump over to, to chapter 4? Well, I tried to do chapter 4 as I study in. There's some references back to chapter 3. And so I was like, all right, I'm just going to finish out chapter 3. So it might even be a short night, but let, who's kidding? I like to talk. You like to talk. We're probably not getting out of here any earlier. So, uh, But we have hope, and hope is important. So we can hope we get out earlier than that. Um, but like I said, Pastor talked about chapter three, or uh, uh, started in chapter three, and he did the first six verses, um, and he encouraged us. And uh, but really, it boiled down to the the bold statement that was made was that Jesus was a bigger deal than Moses. Jesus is a bigger deal than Moses. Now, for us, I would say probably two types of people in this room, people that are like, yes, obviously, and other people who are like, who's Moses? Um, That, you know, I don't think there's, I don't think there's anybody who grew up with a strong belief that Moses is the greatest thing since sliced bread type um, theology, you know, and that, but for for a Jew, somebody with a Jewish background, especially pre-Christ, um, that would have been a very, very common thing. Is Moses was the, you know, kind of the author of the law. He was the, I mean, think about it. He was the one who rescued them out of Egypt. And so um, he was very much celebrated. He was somebody that they would consider the, uh, of all the prophets, one of the highest to ever be sent. Um, and so great respect for Moses um, held him in probably a very spiritual high regard. And so when someone comes in, and I think it's great because I think he's been leading up to this and he took two chapters to make that statement because you just don't kick down the door and say, hey, by the way, Jesus is better than Moses. You know, it's, uh, uh, you know, you just don't do that. Um, and so he kind of worked his way into it. And I, I think it's funny, he had to start with the angels. Like, I won't offend you if I start with Jesus is better, with the, better than the angels, but I'll, I have the, the temptation of offending you because he's greater than Moses is there. But ultimately, that's what he's saying. And the reason he's saying that is because he's going to make comparisons between him and Moses and between the followers of Moses and the followers of Jesus. And because of that, we can kind of look and realize that, okay, he's going to make those comparisons. And, and then ultimately, he needs people to stop looking so intently at the law um, and get their eyes flipped around to looking at Jesus and his righteousness. Um, and, and obviously, the whole gospel spells out why that's important. And we keep digging into it on a weekly basis. We talked why that was so important in Timothy when we were going through that. Um, and so that's kind of what those first six uh, verses were kind of, of speak, speaking about was that Jesus was better than Moses. And so what I want to do is uh, we're going to pick up in chapter 3, verse 7. Um, just a reminder, if you haven't been here or haven't been here in a while, um, Hebrews is a letter slash sermon that was written by an unknown author, and the intent of the author is to remind the reader the supremacy and the completeness of Christ. The supremacy and the completeness of Christ. So let's start in verse 7 through 11. You can read there on your sheets in front of you on the screen or pick your own Bible. It says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. They shall not enter my rest. So the, uh, the, the author of this, he's actually referencing a passage out of Psalms 95. If you went back and looked at Psalms 95, you'd look in verse 7, the second half. It starts out just like that. Now, some of the words are a little bit different, but it's almost as if it was paraphrased and made more for the audience that he was speaking to. But it was very much a, a he was pulling from Psalms 95. Um, and so he's doing that. And I think there's something really cool here. So kind of a side note, but we, how many of you guys have ever heard that the the word of God is inspired? You ever heard it? It's inspired. It's, uh, we've used the verse that said it's God breathed, that God breathed this out. Now, the thing is, though, is how many of you guys understand that the Bible does not have one singular author, that this is a book that was written by many, many, many authors, 
and over many, 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 many years. And so it's, it, it is our understanding and what our belief that we would stand on is that the Bible that we now hold in our hands, um, whatever version, I'm not, we're not talking about versions here, we're talking about the, the canonized scripture, all that has been brought together, we believe that it is all inspired by the Holy Spirit and that it is something that, that even though we had different authors, that God was actually writing all of it through humans. What's really cool is 2,000 years ago, the author of Hebrews believed the same thing because he says, uh, in the verse seven, it says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, and then he goes on to quote something that was written in Psalms because the, what was written in Psalms was written by a person hundreds, I don't know, thousands of years before this moment that he's, he's writing it and yet he makes sure that the, the, the reader of this understands that no man wrote the book of Psalm. No man wrote any of this. This was all led by the Holy Spirit. And so he makes that point that do you realize that the Holy Spirit was speaking back then and he is now speaking again to you. This was 2,000 years ago that he's writing this and to that group. And now, 2,000 years later, the Holy Spirit is still speaking it to each one of you at the table. So this was, this was for the people that wrote and read Psalm. This is for the people that uh, received the, the letter of Hebrew. And this is also for BFCOG right now. The Holy Spirit has written it, wrote it again, and is now writing it in your heart currently. And so he, he definitely makes that correlation there. And then, so if we look, it says, today, if you hear his voice, the problem with that, the minute that you hear this, now you're part of that group. Today, if you hear his voice, this is the word of God. You're hearing his voice right now. So like the minute that you start listening to this, he's like, okay, now you're in the audience that I'm talking about. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. On the day of testing in the wilderness, um, we understand that there was not a day of testing in the wilderness, but there was 40 years of testing in the wilderness um, over and over again with those that were led out of Egypt. It says, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Fathers meaning forefathers, meaning the people that had gone way before them. Um, again, going back to the Exodus and then the, the Israelites and in their time in the desert. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation. Um, what does provoked mean? What's a good word that we would use today for provoked? I was irritated, frustrated, I was mad. God was angry with this generation. He was bothered with them because of the, the way that they had responded to what he had done. He says, they will always go astray in their heart. That's a pretty cool statement. In church, even the way the world looks at church, have you ever guys ever heard the whole um, I don't want to go to church because it's nothing. It's just full of hypocrites. Like you, you, and you're kind of like you want to defend that and argue it, but you're like, well, yeah, it's kind of true, <laughs> you know. The way that church works, or or even oh, you you know, they're they grew up in church. They act different. They you know they're good. They're good kids. Good people. Whatever. We tend to just kind of view, and we do it too. We tend to view church. We tend to view religion. Even our religion, our understanding of the scriptures, we often put it in behavior form. How do we act? What does your behavior look like? What are your actions and things like that? And we really kind of harp on those. But even when God was mad at the Israelites, he wasn't mad at them for their actions. He says, he said he was provoked with that generation. They always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. From a very early on, God has always wrestled with the heart, not actions. Our actions often reveal our heart, but the problem is not the action. I spoke this last Sunday at, at Donica Church of God. I, I, first of all, they have a much prettier drive to church than we do. Like we say, we're pulling into the parking lot behind Starbucks's dumpster. Like that's our drive here. I, it was a beautiful drive. I drove, and I'm not kidding, this deer ran across in the street, and then the two babies followed it, and they weren't even in a hurry. It was like, even the deer know, it's okay. 
It's Sunday morning, we're all good here. But I, I went there and I, I was talking to them and we talked about the fruit of the spirit and I said, here's how you understand that actions aren't as big a deal as relationship, as heart issues. And Because the fruit of the spirit is something we all focus on and we like to look at. And so what name one of the fruits of the spirit. Somebody shout it out. Joy, all right. If you have joy, unlike any other human in this world, and your joy never ends, and you're never, we'll even put it in the terms of you're never sad, and you're never upset, you're always joyful, always. Like Misty, joyful, just blah, joy everywhere. Will that joy get you into heaven? No. What's another fruit of the Spirit? Love. Now, that's a good one. I like love because love's a hot topic. Like, you know, you, like you just... If you'll just love, can we just love each other? Can everyone just love it? If we would just love each other, the world would be a better place. I mean, so what if you were the type of person that you loved absolutely? You had no anger or animosity towards anyone. You had just love just pouring out of you. Not just love of feeling, but love of action. And you just loved everybody. If you did that, would that get you into heaven? No. And so that's right there that we can show that even the fruits of the Spirit, which are a very, very good thing, those actions themselves don't get you into heaven. It's always been a heart issue. And so even before Christ, even back in the Israelites' day, um, it's always been about the heart. And he says, they go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. For that, that would have been, he was trying to lead them to the land that he promised them. The land flowing with milk and honey. And a lot of that generation, in fact, all of that generation who was brought out of Egypt, none of them got to go. They wandered around the desert until they died off and then their children could go. And all because the truth is, is they never, in their heart, they never bought into God. Do you think they believed in God? I mean, you gotta think of these people. These people were brought out of Egypt and how were they brought? Like, was it like a just, hey, come on, no problems, pretty easy? No. I mean, they were brought next to, the, first of all, they saw the 10 plagues and they watched every firstborn of the Egyptians die and theirs were spared because of the blood of the lamb. That'll preach. But then they were also brought up next to the Red Sea and as the enemy's barreling down on top of them, what happens? Like, come on, let's be honest. When you get to heaven, if you had three scenes that you could say, God, will you replay that scene for me in your full heavenly cinematic theater? I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what the popcorn tastes like, but I imagine it's probably pretty good. But that is one of the scenes I wanna see. I wanna know what does the splitting of the Red Sea look like? Like, that would be, I mean, Disney did a pretty cool job because they had a well, but I'm not sure why there was a well in the Red Sea, I don't know how that happened, but like, I, how did it happen? And then they walk on dry ground. Like it can't rain in Indiana for 15 minutes without my whole yard turning into mud for 17 days. And yet he splits a whole river and the ground is dry and there's water on both sides. Like, okay, so that's pretty phenomenal. Do you think after that, do you believe in God? So they believed in God. They had a belief. They were, they were led by pillars of fire and, and funnels of smoke. They were led in which directions to go. Do you think they believed in God? They had manna fall from heaven. Food. I, I'm sorry. That's like a prayer I pray every day. God, make food fall from the sky for me all the time. I mean, they, every, like, I think about all the miracles and the things they saw. And, and so I don't doubt whether they believed but something was missing in their heart that they didn't trust. They didn't buy into God. They didn't fully want to, to surrender over to that. But so it says they didn't get to enter his rest. Now remember, we just got off the verse where he's saying Jesus is greater than Moses. And so he's saying, so these people didn't get to enter into the rest that Moses was promising, that, that was part of the people that followed Moses. They didn't get to enter it. But remember, Jesus is better than Moses, so we have to now take that correlation and understand that Jesus' rest is better than the rest that Moses, that, that Moses was talking about. In verse 12, it says, he, he transitions out of using Psalms 95, and he begins to talk to the, the, the recipients of this letter, and he says, take care, brothers, lest there be any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. I think about 
the word take care. Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you with an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Take care. If I said, Trent, take care that you don't become fat, you would understand that and you would understand that there needs to be actions a part of that take care, right? Like it would be stuff like eat healthy, don't eat that, yeah, don't eat the sugary things, don't eat too much sugary things, don't go back for seconds, thirds, and fourths. Like there would be things that you understood if I said take care to not gain weight, you would begin to, to you would understand that there's ap, uh, actions that are, that are attached with that. I also look, if I said, hey, it's flu season right now, take care that you don't get sick. There's certain things you can do to take care to make sure you don't get sick. Wash them hands just a little bit more. Um, You see people come in with kids, go the other direction, because them little snot-nosed things, they spread them everywhere. Hi. You can take extra vitamin C, beef up, uh, uh, bolster up your vitamin intake. Um, You could make sure you wear a jacket if you're going out into the cold. There's things that you can do to take care to not get sick. If I said take care that you don't, you know, struggle in your finances your whole life, you understand that you're going to have to start putting a budget together. It means um, buying things that you can afford. It means don't max out your credit cards. It means uh, don't spend more than you make. Don't go into debt. Like there's things, if I say take care of your finances, take care to make sure you don't struggle in your finances, there's things you would do to make sure you did that. I want you guys to to talk because what he says is take care lest there be any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the uh, the living God. At your tables, I want you to discuss this. How can we take care to not have an unbelieving heart that would lead us to fall away from the living God? At your tables, go. Questions on the screen. All right, I'm gonna actually, I got one more. I'm just gonna throw it right back to your table. So if you wanna continue on this one and then add that one to it, you can. Um, or I'll give you some new material to talk about. Um, so the very next, one, for the first it said, um, you know, take care, brothers, lest there be any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. And then in verse 13 it says, but exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. To exhort someone is to encourage someone. Now, be cautious on encourage because sometimes we fluff it up a little bit like it's saying nice words to somebody. But to encourage somebody is to instill courage into someone, which can sometimes be by talking nice to them or saying something nice. But think of it, maybe even there's more layers to it than just saying something really nice. Um, That can be part of it. But even just, uh, sometimes it's even correction or um, kind of the kick in the butt somebody might need. You need to give them that courage, that little like, man, get up and do it. You can do this. But how does, uh, I wanted you guys to talk about this too. How does encouragement help others to not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin? So you can kind of wrap the last question and then this one. How does encouragement help others to not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin? Go. Alrighty. Sometimes I, um, I do my own table talk here up in my own chair by myself. And so like, because, you know, I like, I, I try to give you guys as many questions as possible, but sometimes the verse just doesn't really hand it to you. Um, and so I, I love throwing them back. But a lot of times whenever I do that in my notes, I'm like, all right, you guys go get it. I'm in my head. I like go to the next verse and start looking up, you know, what are we going to talk about? 
when this one, I had a weird thought. Because I, I was trying to think in my head, I said, hey, encouragement isn't just saying nice things, but it's instilling courage. And I was like, that's fun to say, but what are other types of encouragement besides saying, hey, Tristan, nice shirt, bud. Um, you know, so what are other things? And I started thinking, like, I, I kind of have this, like, I have this dream, and it's kind of been building in me lately. Um, I want to start a business. Like, I want to start my own business, which is really weird for me because I, I tend to not be the real risk taker or anything. But because I'm not a risk taker, that makes me really scared. Like, the whole idea of, like, stepping out on my own and I'm going to do this and all this makes me super nervous. And, and in my head, it's like, I, I, whether this was the Holy Spirit speaking to me or the fact that I ate a chicken Caesar wrap right before I came up here, I don't know. But the, the thought jumps in my head that, do you know what would help me a lot? is if somebody says, I believe in you and you can do this, that would help a little bit. I'd be like, thanks, bud. But if they said, I believe in you so much that I believe that even if you go out there and you fail, I'll financially back you until you get back on your feet. Like, do you know how much courage I would have to go start a business if someone is like, I, hey, this is, you go out there and do it. I believe in you so much that I'm willing to take care of you if this didn't work out. Like, the courage that I'd have to go into that dream would be phenomenal. Like, I'd be like, let's do it tomorrow. And I thought, like, spiritually, that's, I think, also a type of encouragement is that to be able to, to help people believe in themselves, to really go out and push for things and do things, but know that you still have their back no matter what, to know that you're still going to support them in prayer, um, to, to, to know that they're still going to have you there all the time. Um, that helps add courage. And so though that's a physical encouragement for a, a worldly dream, um, I look and go, I think there's spiritually, we can add courage to people's life by simply them understanding, like, that you can, me here's the thing, I'm, I guess what I'm saying to you right now, I don't know how everybody in here feels, but you can mess up in this church and I still love you. You can, you can go out and, 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 and make a mistake because you're trying something and, and, and we still support you. And so I think if we could do that more as community and togetherness and with one another, I think that would add a lot of courage to our lives um, of going out and doing something. And so uh, that was just something that I had in my mind. Hopefully, you guys had some great discussion. Um, let's jump into verse 14. Um, we are like whittling down here, guys. I'm, I'm getting nervous. We may have like talk time at the end. Whoa. Uh, verse 14, it says, For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. I just want to break this verse down. It says, we share in Christ. By share in Christ, that, that means we belong to Christ. We each, it's kind of hard because if I said um, you had a share of a business, each of you would have a portion of that business. But the problem is, is that that illustration somewhat falls down with Christ because you don't have a portion of Christ. Each of you have all of Christ. You know, it doesn't like he's not divided up and, you know, you got 1% of Jesus and you got 1%. Hopefully you got the forgiving side, you know. Like you get all of Jesus, you get all of Jesus. We all share in Jesus. We are all a part of Jesus. We are in the family of Jesus. So we, we have a share in Christ. We each belong. And then it says if. If is a contingent word. They'd be like, Trent, I love you. If, and then so my love is contingent upon whatever I say right after that. Um, and so the, that's a contingent. And so he says, if, and then he says, we hold our original confidence. So it, we, if we hold our original confidence, then we will still share in Christ. We will still have a portion, a, or we, still ha we are a part of Christ with him if we hold our original confidence. Our original confidence is that we confess that Christ is Lord, that he is supreme over all, that you don't need Jesus and anything else. You don't need anything else on top of Jesus for salvation. We don't need to add to it. You'll see it all throughout other New Testament books. Paul tackles this all the time. Judaizers came in. Um, they, want, they started saying, hey, great if you're a Christian, but you also need to be circumcised. And the problem that, that Paul had with that, he's like, if you're going to be circumcised, then that means you're going to follow the law. And if you're going to follow that law, you got to follow all the law. And if you follow all the law, then you are nullifying Jesus and what he can do in your life. 
And so he says, if you hang on to your original confidence that Jesus is Lord, he is my only salvation, I need him and can't do it alone, and there is nothing else that needs to be added to Jesus for salvation. He says, if you will hang on to that confidence firm to the end, it has to last it has to last. I, um, I may have used this illustration before, but I think it, it still applies. Um, how many of you guys have ever watched the Antique Road Show? <laughs> I love that show, and I have no idea why. I would never go antiquing. It's not my thing. I don't have any antiques in my house. That's craziness. But I always love, you know, like when somebody goes up there and, you know, they bring some. I love when they think they have something special, and then it's not at all. They're like, yeah, this is a knockoff from like 20 years ago. And they're like, oh. But then there's always that one time that like somebody's like, this was in my grandfather's garage and they bring it up and it's this nice chair. It's, you know, kind of ornate and all this. And they flip it over and they're like, oh, wow, that's a big deal. And like who it was made by. And they're like, this is worth $250,000. And you're like, this is a chair. What the heck? All this. But you begin to like, they, they help kind of piece the story together. The reason that it's valued so high is because of who made it. Like, who made it is kind of what makes it value. The fact that it's in as good a shape as it is, that helps it. Now, here's what I want, here's how I want you guys to understand when it talks about if you will hold on to your original confidence till the very end. This is why it matters. If I took that chair, that $250,000 chair, and I picked it up and I slammed it on the ground and it shattered into pieces, is it still worth $250,000? No, but I'm like, but all the pieces are here. You know, I could get every, you know, all, well, here's a splinter. Here's a splinter. It makes me think of Monster Zinc and I'm putting the door back together. They, thank you for going there with me. Uh, but you like, you get it. Like all the pieces are there, but the value is gone because it didn't make it. I, and, and, and again, you think like that's what made the chair so valuable in the, in, the, in the beginning was that there might have been even a lot of those chairs. It's just, it's amazing for it to last 250 years or whatever. And so there's that, that's where the value comes from. So now it just becomes something else that was made a long time ago that didn't last. And in the same way, that's why our, our holding on to, and this is why he's really coming down on, on the people of, that are reading this letter that hang on to that original faith. Don't let it go. Don't start going astray. Don't start looking in other directions. Don't start following that. You have to last. Whatever your time is on earth, it has to last. Hang on to your belief that Jesus is who he says he is and that he is enough. I went to study, and I'm not going to even dive into this. I just want you to understand because I think it might be in some of your minds. Um, I totally understand that right now this brings up the thing of you're saying that I can lose my salvation. Um, it, it's funny because it, depending on which Bible you read and what, what kind of position they hold on once saved, always saved, or no, you can lose your salvation. In their notes, it always explains it the way that they believe. And I'm like, well, I mean, it's, there's some, that's a tough phrase right there. Like, that's tough to hear. Like, if, if is a contingent statement. If you hang on, then you will still share in Jesus. The belief would be, and this is why, when you walk out of here, you can still believe whichever one you believed when you came in here, and here's why. Because you could stand on the statement that says, I really, that person really was a Christian, and they really were a follower, but they didn't hang on. They lost their faith. They stopped believing Jesus who, uh, Jesus is who he said he was, and so they lost their share of Jesus. Or you could say, Anyone who ever had a share of Jesus would never, ever turn their back on him and would never let go. They would hang on to the very end, so that person never knew Jesus. And so either way, whichever way you think, it doesn't clarify anything past than what we just read, but wherever you stand, you're okay. The truth is, is don't let go and it won't matter. You don't have to find out. Don't let go. Whether you, if you let go, then maybe you never believed anyways. If you let go, maybe you did. I don't know, and I don't have the magic wand. It's in the back, and it's out of battery, so I can't wave it over you to find out. But at the end of the day, what he's, and, and, and I think the author even leaves it at this way of like, just don't. Just last. Don't be pulled away by some of the things that the world comes in and says. Don't be pulled away by some new fancy book that's, that's written. At the end of the day, Jesus is who he says he is, and he's not giving up on you. You don't give up on him, and he is enough for you. 
and let that be enough and it won't matter in the end. Uh, you will last and you will be a $250,000 chair in the eyes of Jesus because he made you and you lasted. Amen? In verses 15 through 18, well, verse 15 first, it says, as it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion. So he went back to that Psalms 95 thing Basically, this was just a writing style to say, hey, I'm about to talk about that again. So he's kind of opening up their mind to that again. He says in verse 16, for who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all of those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned? Whose body fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? He begins to break down and, and kind of remind them and go a little deeper. Like, listen, like, these were your forefathers. These were your great, 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 great grandparents. These were people who used to believe like you used to believe. And it's like Moses had showed them the way. And God had made himself evident and proved it. And yet they just would not believe they would not follow. Earlier, he's like, they did not know my ways. And I love that, that thought, because like, man, I think a prayer that you should pray often for yourself, for your kids, and for the people that you love is, man, could we have the eyes that Jesus has? God, let me see things the way you see things. Let me feel the things that you feel. Because again, man, we sometimes, we spend way too much energy working on our behavior and not near enough energy working on our relationship. Man, when you are intimately knowing God, I mean, when you are deep into that relationship and trying to, to begin to see the people in your church the way God sees them, begin to see the people in this world the way God sees them, man, that changes you, and that begins to, that's when your actions just become a byproduct of your heart, rather than tr constantly trying to strive to change your actions. Like, it, it's funny, patience. I always love patience. Because it's like, man, the minute I stick you behind somebody in the grocery store that has coupons, like, that's when you're like, all patience gets tested. You're like, really? Really? Really in front of me? You're, really, you're gonna pull those out? Like, but the thing is, is there just becomes this natural ability to be like Christ the more you hang out with them the more you spend time with them, the more you pray for that. God, let me have your heart. Let me see things the way that, I, the way that you see those things. And the people that left Egypt didn't. They spent way too much time trying to figure out what they were supposed to get out of it. It wasn't meeting their expectations. This isn't going the way. How many people have you known that started church and seemed to really like it, but left because the church didn't meet their expectations? Because God didn't do what they wanted them to do or because it didn't work out the way they thought. And I'm not bashing on these people, but that's exactly what it was for these. Sure, you rescued us, but rescued us to what? To the desert? Why don't you just send us back to Egypt? At least we had food there. And then food falls out of heaven. Well, it was good food. Like it was just this constant, what can you do for me? And God's like, you're not getting it. And because of that, they never entered the rest. In verse 19, this is our last one. It says, so we, uh, so we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. So that last verse in verse 18, I'll read it again. It says, and to whom did he swear that they would never enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. There was a generation of Hebrews that left Egypt. They saw the miracles, but they just simply would not surrender. And because of this, they never got to enter into the, into the rest, into the land that God had promised them. But the author does something interesting here. He makes a correlation with verse 18 that disobedience stems from unbelief. Disobedience, and here's the thing. Take your eyes off of anyone in your life right now. Take your eyes off your husband. Take your eyes off of your kids, your parents, your coworker, and put your eyes on yourself. And I'm gonna do the same to myself while I sit up here at my own table. Your, dis your disobedience stems from unbelief. 
your disobedience, the things you do that you know you're not supposed to do, the things you do that God didn't ask you to do, the things you do or don't do even though God's asked you to do them, that disobedience, this author is correlating it and saying it stems from unbelief. I want you guys to talk about that at your table, and we're gonna end on that note. Um, I'll, I'll pray us out here in just a bit. But how can disobedience reveal unbelief in different ways? You don't have to bring up your own. You can if you would like. Don't be weird. But just talk about in general, how can these things be? How can um, disobedience reveal unbelief? Go. All right, I'm going to, to pray us out. No rush to get out of here. You guys don't have to leave. You can pick your kids up in the next five minutes, and you'd still have them early. Um, but before I do pray, I want to uh, let everyone know, remind you, you might have been hearing from the Sunday announcements. Um, so next week, we're doing just a, a kind of a hangout, all together hangout. Um, we'll have some, I think they're, we're trying to get a hayride together for some of the kids, and they'll have a maze and roasting marshmallows and doing s'mores, things like that. Um, what it is not, I'm just letting you know, it's not like a giant festival. This wasn't a giant outreach. I'm trying to get a lot of people here. Um, and it's mainly for the fact that we still value connection with one another as well. Um, I don't believe in winning people to a church that, uh, of a church that doesn't know one another. Um, then it just makes another stranger. <laughs> um, and so I want to bring people to this church um, to, to, to know Christ and to, to, to learn who Christ is but also to learn what it looks like to be in Christ's body. And part of Christ's body is that fellowship. And so um, we kind of decided just a few weeks ago that we wanted to put something to the, together just to hang out. Uh, we've tried to design it to the best we can to where it's not something where it's a constant event that you gotta, that you gotta go to or something like that, but that you can just sit back, relax, and hang out with the people that you love, people that you know. Um, and so we wanna invite you. But in the same token, if there is somebody that you do know that you're like, you know what? This might be a good introduction to what the church really is, and it is the love and the fellowship that we have for one another because of who Christ is in our lives. It would be a great opportunity. And so if somebody, God's laid anyone on your heart, I would encourage you, hey, invite them. I think it, they'd have a fantastic time. But like I said, we'll be roasting s'mores. We're going to have a bonfire. Um, it'll be fun, lit things for the little kids, but it'll all be kept in a small area. Um, right now, 30% chance of rain. So we'll see if it's indoors or outdoors. We might be cooking s'mores over on the stovetop in the kitchen. Um, but either way, we're going to have a great time. Um, we're going to love on one another, have a good time. Um, and then also, um, if you haven't had a chance to get a raffle ticket from the youth, that's what that, uh, that little fire pit out there, you have a chance to win that. I wasn't here for the announcement. Is that correct? Do they get a raffle ticket? And do they get it from the youth ministry? So before you leave tonight, if you want to get that, or if you would like to on Sunday, that's going to support any kid um, that's a part of the ministry that wants to go on um, the winter uh, conference that they're going to, or if they get more and uh, uh, abundantly more than what covers that, it just keeps going back to, to trips that the youth take. So no matter what, it's always gonna support them. I know for me, that's where Christ made a huge impact in my life was going to visit the conferences, the retreats, the camps, things like that. Um, you just get tired of the same old, same old hearing Chase talk every week. It just gets boring. But you go on these little special events and all of a sudden God gets your attention and changes your life. And so um, support the youth and what they're doing. Um, so make sure you get one of those. And then other than that, man, we love you. We'll see you Sunday. And you have three minutes before you have to get your kids. So you stay and talk all three minutes. Don't you dare rush out of here. Six next week. So six next week just to give yourself time. We will be serving chili and I think a chicken noodle soup, but I'm not sure. Chili, hot dogs, uh, brisket. No, I'm just kidding. But if I say really good food, ribeyes and, you know, prime rib, filet mignons for all the ladies. Yeah? Okay. See you guys Sunday. <laughs>